on this computer. All right. So welcome everybody. Welcome to my Majlis. Uh, Majlis is a sitting area where we get together and we chat about our day and our life. And here we're going to talk about the SEA. We're going to talk about um, just arts and sciences and the service that we do uh, within the kingdom, out of kingdom, uh, within the society. And I like to bring people on who have given different aspects of arts, science, or service to uh, our group, to the SCA. So today we have His Lordship, Sato Takauji. And um, if you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. Uh, absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm Saito Takauji, or just Uji. Um, I, my persona, my primary persona, since I am working on a secondary, is a 16th century, very, very, very late 16th century Japanese nobleman um, in the court of uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who will become shogun in just a couple of years, but that's out of period since he solidifies the country in December of 1600. Mundanely, um, I have lived in Kalantir for 10 years now, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> I've kind of lived everywhere, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I've definitely lived in more places than the average Skadian. I uh, currently live in the barony of Magmore, uh, and am very happy to be here today. Well, welcome. It's really amazing how fast time goes by when you're living somewhere. I, I've... <laughs> lived in Missouri for almost 20 years now. And it's just crazy. Like, how did that happen? I have no idea. But time just flies. You say time flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> right. Um, so why don't you tell us about your SEA history? How long have you been in the SEA? Sure, I joined, I have a very firm start date. The first time I ever encountered the SEA was uh, the third weekend in August in 2004, because I was literally my first day by myself on campus in college. And I was feeling kind of homesick. And rather than do what, what would have been a good bet for me to do, stay inside and, and play video games, um, I decided I was gonna go explore and go to the Fall Bazaar, where all the student groups were presenting. And I saw a pretty girl in a weird dress and wandered over to see what that was about and found people doing calligraphy and then wandered on a little bit more and found people doing armored combat and figured those two things were related and stuck around pestering people with questions until everything was done and they invited me to go back to Perkins with them. And that was it. And that was, like I said, 16 years ago as of a couple weeks ago. That's amazing that you remember the day and the place. And I, I love how many people I've spoken to at this point who found it in college. Yeah. It's, it's a really, it, really, you're gonna find other people who like to learn and explore and are curious about things. And that's a great thing. Um, so how many other places in the known world have you lived? So I was counting because, uh, for that question. I have lived in three kingdoms and I have lived in now six different SEA groups within those kingdoms. Six? Yeah, I started in the barony of Unterhofen, which is Fort Collins, Greeley and Loveland, Colorado. Then the barony of Kerta, which is Denver. Then the Canton of Golden Plain in the Palatine barony of the far west, which is all of Asia. Um, then the Shire of Crescent Moon, which is Topeka, Kansas, the Barony of Lonely Tower, which is Omaha, Nebraska, and now the Barony of Magmore, which is Magmore. So what was your first event? So I, I kind of have two first events in that one was the real event and one was the first kind of event. The first kind of event was a champions event in a park in Fort Collins that was thrown together because the guy who was the heavy weapons champion of the barony was going to become the baron next week. And okay. so they needed a new, he needed a new heavy weapons champion when he stepped up. Um, and so they threw that together in a hurry when he, would, he and his uh, baroness were selected. The first real event I went to was two weeks later in the barony and it was the newcomers event that they have every year. And that's the event that I kind of considered to be my anniversary and an event I still try to go back to when I can because I think it's such a cool idea for an event. 
Why don't you tell, tell me about it? What's cool about it? What did you like about it? So it's an event that the Barony of Unterhofen hosts every year that is specifically dedicated to newcomers. So there's not an ANF competition or a, a rapier or an armored combat competition for established people. There are those competitions only for people who've been playing two years or less. And all of the classes are geared towards people who have been playing, not, who are not established in the SCA and to introduce them to uh, different kinds of activities. So in the, in the two weeks from, my first, from that champions event until that weekend, I studied the entire rapier manual and having done some fencing in high school, I authorized in FCA rapier and I came in second in the newcomers tournament. And I authorized in armored combat and I did very poorly in the armored combat tournament, but had a <laughs> great time. And I had done so many different things for, during the day that the Baron and Baroness invited me and my dad, who was there with me to watch this weird cult his son was joining, invited us to sit at head table. And so I ended up speaking to the then Baroness of Dragonspine, which is Colorado Springs, for the entire feast. And she was very uh, uh, entertaining and, and patient with a very new player who was full of questions. And it was just an amazing moment at a day made to give new people kind of amazing moments. I, I like that idea, the idea that everything's about newbies and um, new people, newcomers and that letting them have the moment to shine. And I, uh, that's, that's a really wonderful concept. I like it. If, if you ever, it's almost always in September or October. If you ever want to spend a weekend in the mountains in Fort Collins, it's a phenomenal event to go out to. Well, I always want to spend a weekend in the mountains. <laughs> 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 Who doesn't? So, so you said something that uh, it reminds me of when I first joined the SCA. Uh, just a moment ago about your dad coming to see this cult that you were joining. <laughs> did you, how did, how did you get past that with him? Because I, I had some friends so, who thought they wanted to have an intervention with me at some points. <laughs> I, I, that, that was mostly me joking. My dad has always kind of understood and has been very patient with the fact that I like joining things. My mom, I think to this day is still a little bit hesitant or, or doesn't understand necessarily what I get from it and definitely wishes that I spent more time in college studying rather than doing the SEA. Um, but I think for me what kind of got my mom on board was understanding that yes this is a, a kind of a weird thing but it's also a safe weird thing uh, uh, almost universally and that it was helping me figure out who I was and who I wanted to be as an adult, especially because I joined in college. It was like, okay, who does Uji want to be now that he's not a kid, now that he, he has to do this adult thing for the rest of his life, allegedly. That's neat, that's neat, it is. Um, right, so how, like what hooked you? You said, you said the event, all about newcomers, was it the doing very well in the tournaments or was there something else that hooked you into this? I think ultimately what hooked me was not the things I did, although those were, I mean, I had a blast and, and I've done uh, rapier and now cut and thrust ever since. And the things that I saw that day kind of made me, put me on the course I'm on. But I think what was so important in hooking me was that first day at the fall bazaar where it was not just, hey, anyone who wants to come can come with us to Perkins afterwards. It was, hey, you, Matt, you specifically are invited to be a part of this. And that kind of invitation and acceptance that, you know, of, of a, uh, I just turned 19 because I'm old in the year cycle for uh, uh, going to school. Um, I just turned 19. I knew nobody in Greeley you in particular are invited to come along and be a part of this was a powerful statement to a lonely 19 year old. And it was that kind of acceptance and continued invitation to keep coming back that made me really, really hooked. That's something that we should try to remember, uh, remembering to 
not just throw a blanket invite out there to go specifically to somebody and remember their name and say, do you want to come with us? You know, and that's yeah, exactly. We should we should try to remember to keep that keep doing that in the future. Um, so your Japanese persona, correct? How did you, like, was that your first persona? How did you settle on it? So I have been Uji for the entire time I've been in the FDA. And it's actually only recently I've started looking at doing something in addition to it. It came down a lot for me to, uh, uh, those, those first six months I thought I was either going to do Japanese or I was going to do very Southern France where France and Spain start to kind of blend. And my name was going to be Arias de Renard. And looking at it, I was like, okay, I can do kind of a generic Southern French, or I can do a much more specific Japanese because I'd always been interested in Japanese history. I'd gotten hooked on it through gaming and then wanting more research and historical knowledge uh, than kind of the pseudo Japanese fantasy setting we played in was giving me. And eventually my minor in history ended up being in Asian history with a focus on Japanese history because I had that interest. So very early on, I was able to go, I can do a lot better. I can do a lot more meaningful if I do Japanese than if I do Southern French. And I already know I like it. So why not go with what I love and what I know better? I love it. That's that. So many people will go with the easier one, um, being the generic one. But for you, it was easier to do something that you had already been studying and already been interested in. And you didn't go with your history. You went with no. <laughs> you went with your passion, and I like it. I like it. And I. I very early said, I don't want to go with my own history because as a Jew, that's not a lot of fun history. And I know that history, but I don't want to do it. So. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, um, what, what is the most, what is one very interesting you learned about your persona early on? I think the most interesting thing getting into it early on is really getting into the weird way that the Japanese dual nobility worked in period. Because for most of period, there were two sets of, noble, of nobility. There was the Kuge, who were the traditional court aristocracy around the emperor. And then there were the Buke, who were the military aristocracy around the shogun. And the interplay between the two is fascinating because even though after 1185, it was all the bouquet, it was all the warrior uh, aristocracy, they still paid lip service to the primacy of the emperor's court. And so to become shogun was to first beat everybody else and then be acknowledged with a court rank by the emperor. Even though you would spend the rest of your career as shogun, not caring what the emperor did at all, you still in that moment had to go pay homage to the son of heaven. And so it was a really interesting tension at the heart of, of Japanese culture in the period. I like that. I think that, um, that they had them separated into military and palace, you know, courts. Um, it's actually the way it is in most cultures but they don't actually spell it out, if that makes sense. You know, there's a hierarchy no, guess, yeah. in military and there's a hierarchy in the court, but they don't actually separate them. They always say the, the court is number one and the military is here, but to put them on equal, equal levels is kind of, that's very neat, it is. All right, so and then I wanted to know about what you think of foreign wars. Tell me about your first foreign war and how you feel about them. So starting as an outlander at the time, the only war we cared about was Australia. The Outlands goes to Pensick, but it, it's a, that's a long drive or a decent flight. 
So it's not nearly as important. It was, Estrella is the thing we push for, the thing we yell about in court, the thing we hold practices for. And so kind of uh, uh, on a whim and definitely not to my academic interest, um, I went to Estrella six months after I joined. And that was my first foreign war. I drove down with the squire of Sir Dietrich, uh, who was a former Calentieri. Uh, and uh, Connell was at the time quitting smoking and putting up with me for 15 hours each way in a car ride for which he should be sainted. Um, <laughs> and I loved it. Estrella is in many ways not my favorite foreign war I've been to now that I've been to other ones. But at the time, it was amazing. I was there with my, seemed like my entire kingdom. And I was, I, I fought in the rapier battles and nobody seemed to mind that I was in a neon blue flannel tunic that was very inexpertly sewn by myself. Um, I bought a cloak. I went to my first Bardic. Because uh, that was the first time I ever saw real Bardic. And that's the event where I met Duchess Merwin. And although at the time uh, she was Mistress Merwin and uh, came into the story about her being a little bit drunk and saying very loudly to me, Oogie, who names themselves Oogie? How old are you? <laughs> I miss her. I do. I do too. And she'll love that I got this, that story into this. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but I loved it. That's great. That's great. So tell me about your first, obviously you were in the Outlands at the time, but what was your first out of kingdom experience? Tell me about what that felt like. So that's, uh, uh, there were two right in a row, and I, I'm going to include the second one just because the second one was Lily's. Um, Lily's was actually my second out of kingdom uh, event ever, and my second out of, uh, out of kingdom war ever. Uh, the first one was a tournament I went to called Quest for Camelot, uh, which is in uh, near Rapid City, Deadwood, that area in South Dakota. And I went and I had a blast. And I met uh, uh, Sir Joel, who just now moved to our kingdom uh, mm -hmm. back when he was Lord Exel. Um, it was amazing. And it was, uh, both of them were so powerful in teaching me about how big the society was and how different each kingdom was in a way that we don't really see in as much in America, where there's a Walmart everywhere, right? I came to Calentier for lilies, and I saw everyone wearing circlets. And Master Grimwolf knows this story because I told it to him when we first met. I saw everyone wearing circlets, and I thought, this kingdom must give out grants of arms like candy. <laughs> because in the Outlands, a circlet signifies you have a grant of arms. So to see everyone walking around with them, I thought, oh my God. And only later realized, okay, no, that's just because a king of the Outlands decided that grants should get circlets. That's not how most of the society does it, but it was just so eye-opening. And Lily's is, is what Lily's is, especially when you're 19 years old and you go for the whole week and you forget what air conditioning is. And <laughs> you watch Master, you watch then his Lordship Donald make chicken wine and you get to hold a falcon. And it was amazing. <laughs> Lily's is magical. It really is. I think we are all in many ways chasing that first, oper that first time we were ever at Lily's because it is such an amazing feeling. Oh, right. It was my second event, Lily's oh, was. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it, magic. It was just, and it's always magic. There's always something magical. Well, there's always something magical at every war, I think. There's not a war I've been to that I haven't felt some. But yeah. so this is that that's the end of this portion of talking about like your beginning in the SEA. So does anybody have any questions for Uji about his time, um, you know, out, out of kingdom out in Outlands and when he first started 
to fall in love with the SCA. So, Uji, you, you didn't tell us about the time you started a Shire in Thailand. Um, well, I didn't want to, you know, bog down <laughs> that section too much. Um, the Canton of Golden Plain is the canton that covers Bangkok, Thailand. Technically, it covers all of Thailand because there's not another one. But is it, that where if it Fabiano were to, is? It would only cover. Yes, that's where Fabiano is, and that's where he came from. Uh, uh, which is how, when he said, "I'm going to the United States for college," and we asked what group, where he was going, and he said, "I'm going to St. Louis." I said, "Oh, that's the barony of Three Rivers." I've been to Kalantir a bunch of times for Lilies and Valor. Let's look up who the Baron and Baroness are and I'll send them an email. Um, but we found, uh, uh, when I moved out there, there were, I, through a mutual connection in the West, there were two other uh, Skadians living there. And so we started trying to put together a canton since it turns out there were three of the five we would need. And it didn't go anywhere for a while until we got this email saying, hey, we found the SCA online. We're interested in joining, in joining. We started our own group here, but we think the SCA would be better. And it was signed King Fabian of Skyhawk. <laughs> because when you start your own group, of course you get to be king and all your right? friends are nice. And so we met up with Fabian and uh, uh, two other guys at a mall and kind of soft, soft stepped around like, you know, you have to start over and you can't come in as a king. But when we finally set it out right, they're like, oh, no, we know we'll get there. Like, cool. All right. Um, and, and it kind of snowballed from there after we convinced them that wearing 20 gauge steel armor was not going to cut it. Um, because they had very thin metal armor that they had paid a blacksmith to learn how to make. Um, wow. <laughs> and just the laziest flat snap dented it to hell and back. But yeah, yeah and then we found a Laurel living in the wilds uh, who had just kind of thought the SCA was behind him because there was nobody there and was delighted and was so old school a laurel that wait, he wait a second a you need to explain that a laurel living in the wild explain that to me <laughs> so uh his name was clement saint christoph and he unfortunately just passed uh last year um he had joined the sea in 1970 he had a laurel in music he was so old school SCA that he didn't really have a persona. He described his persona as first century SCA. And he had, his life had taken him through Europe and then uh, from the West to Europe, back to the West. And then he moved to Thailand where he started teaching at Chulalongkorn University uh, and kind of decided, I can't seem to get an SCA group going. I guess that time in my life has passed. But he had friends in Atlantia and Baroness Abe and Baron E, who were the two other people that were the kind of core founding members, are from Atlantia. And so when she went back to visit her family, she went to an Atlantean event and she gave elephants to the crown of Atlantia. And the crown of Atlantia, uh, a, a friend of Clements there saw that, emailed him, and he got in touch with us. And we were like, oh my God, we have a peer, thank heavens, because none of us were peers at the time. Ian Abe <laughs> now are both pelicans. I was like, oh good, we've been faking it. Here's someone who actually knows what they're talking about. So, so you think peers actually know what they're talking about? <laughs> or at least are better at pretending to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And he was great because he, he knew all the founders. And so he could tell not just the ties, but he could tell all of us about stories of, you know, meeting uh, uh, Fleeg and, uh, uh, I'm spacing on names now, Diana Listmaker and the people that named the SCA the SCA. And it was great. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. It's amazing that I think we could have a whole, Alan has a question for you. I have yeah, a question. I think Alan was working. Um, 
concerning inner kingdom um, differences, when did you become aware of those? And was it a thing like I, I try if I know somebody's leaving Calentier for uh, to, uh, uh, you know, go down in Steora for an event or something, I try to point out that, oh, there are there are in their kingdom anthropology differences. When did you become aware of those? So I think it was it was really Lily's that did it the most. Um, that first event uh, that I went to out of Kingdom, Quest for Camelot, there's a lot of overlap between that half of North Shield and the Outlands because the Shire of Shattentor is closer to two or three Outlands baronies than it is to uh, any other North Shield group or North Shield barony at least. So it didn't feel that different. Going to Lily's was the first time where it was like, and, and Estrella is Estrella, right? Wars have their own completely different feeling. Lily's was the first time where I felt, oh, there are some really interesting differences here. Like, like I said, the circlet thing. And then when I was looking at coming out, uh, lady, uh, now her ladyship, Caitlin, uh, who was someone I knew online and was the reason I came to Lily's, had to say, well, Palantir doesn't have fencing, so you don't need to bring your, your rapier stuff. I was like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing that can exist. Like, I didn't know there were activities that can be different. So uh, I'd known that there were awards that could be different, right, that each kingdom had its own sl uh, slate of awards. But the idea that there can be a whole different set of activities, and then Calentir, with its so strong early period focus, so strong Anglo-Saxon and North focus, that was a huge difference because the Outlands doesn't have a kingdom persona, or if it does, it's at, it's at most kind of vaguely crusadery. Um, because I would have thought of the, the my association with the Outlands has always been uh, more Middle Eastern. Yeah, there's, well, crusadery, I meant to include both, uh, both okay. sides of that. Okay. Um, because there's a lot of Middle Eastern and there's, but there's also a very strong contingent of people who do like Templar personas and do Christians in, um, Christians in the Levant personas, but it's nowhere near as defined as Calentiers is. Like the Outlands doesn't have a, a scheme, a naming scheme for their awards. Like Calentier has the feared and the here. Mm -hmm. Like there's just, it is not nearly as strong. And that was a huge one. That and, and the singing was a huge cultural difference to be exposed to. The singing is a big thing in Kalantir. <laughs> I don't realize it until I'm in another kingdom. I'm like, where's the bar? Oh, they don't do that here. Okay. <laughs> well, and just how specific it is. Like the Outlands does bardics, but it's bardics are generally for bards and bard supporters and mm -hmm. or bardic competitions. But there is not this, it's the last night of lilies, we're going to have 70 people around the fire singing. It just, that, that was such a huge difference. It is, it is. Okay. I visited the Outlands for an event early on and um, households, walled oh, encounters, yeah. just that, that struck us as being really odd. You were a peer, so we will welcome. And that, yeah. that is a huge difference. It is, it is. When I went to uh, my first Penzik, I was introduced to the household concept. So, <laughs> it, I mean, we have households in Kalantir, they're just not the same. But, they're in, right, they're peer, they're, right, they're so, peer family. I wanted to move towards, uh, I, I was looking up information on you and you have a pretty interesting, uh, extensive calendar wiki. You have moved all over the known world, it seems like. You've been in a lot of different places and you have quite an impressive list of awards and honors and offices held. So I initially asked you here today to just talk about your scroll text writing. But when I found these, I said, I can't just pass this up. I need to ask you some questions about this. 
Um, okay. So I'm going to read just what I, what I counted. There are 12 court positions listed, 16 office positions listed, 19 awards, and 12 of those are from other kingdoms. So <laughs> I want to ask you a couple questions. So what was your favorite court position that you ever held and why? I think my favorite court position that I've ever had was when I was White Hawk Herald to Ashira Ashland uh, for their second reign because I love court heraldry and I, it was something that I had always wanted to do and never gotten to do. I'd gotten to do uh, uh, fill-ins. I'd done courts for other, a bunch of other crowns, but I'd never been the court herald. And so getting to do that and be there week after week after week, because there, that rain we missed, I think two events total they were at. Um, I love being behind the chairs and getting to see people getting awards because I get to be a part of their best day, maybe of the year, possibly of their lives. And in a way that I've never, I've never been anywhere near a good enough uh, uh, armored fighter to be a crown competitor and, and probably never will be. That's how I can be a part of that. And that's how I can, get to see the shock and, and the happiness and the joy of, of someone who is truly unprepared for an award getting one. I, I thank, thank you for sharing that. I, I love hearing that part of court. I, it really, it really just the, um, everyone in the background of court and people don't realize that how many people go into creating a court but being the white hawk you get to kind of almost run the show a little bit <laughs> so, run the show with the permission of their majesty <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so then what was your favorite office that you held and why so I think that that comes down between two. Um, one is I, I, for very similar reasons, I loved being Gold Falcon. I absolutely loved being Gold Falcon Principal Herald because I, I love heraldry for a similar reason. I love, I love book and name heraldry for a similar reason to court heraldry in that when someone is coming to register a name and a device, they are saying, help me define who I am in this society help me figure out who I am and then make that happen. And that's such an important thing. And it's so important to get right because when it goes right, nobody tells stories about it. And when it goes wrong, everyone talks about it because everyone's heard about the, the people getting screwed over by the Herald or people who couldn't have the name or device they wanted and got, and were very upset. And so it's so important to have the to have it in a good place where it can go right. And I loved being a part of that. I loved uh, uh, for January of I want to say I think it was 2018. I cut prices for heraldry registration in half for one month. Anyone who wanted to register a name or a device, the only cost they paid was the society mandated cost. And I got to give the kingdom a 12th night present. And we had the largest letters of registration that Calentir has had, at least as long as I've lived in it. And got to have people who came out of nowhere, who've been playing for years and said, well, I guess if it's half off, I should probably register something and get, and get what they wanted. <laughs> but I also really enjoyed, I was chairman of the Grand Council for two years. And the Grand Council was the advisory committee to the board of directors. And... I was, on the, I was on the Grand Council for like four or five years and I was chairman for two of it. And it was fascinating getting, the, the Grand Council would be given questions by the board of directors and as a committee formulate a response and recommendation. And there was no guarantee that the board would listen to our recommendations because they were the ultimate decision makers. But getting to have see behind the scenes and have a hand in saying, well, no, this is what we probably should be focusing on, or this is how we should respond, uh, had been something I was, I was interested in 
since the man who is my pelican was in the grand council when I started, and they were asked about whether the FDA should have a firm start date. And they had to grapple with, are we going to kick, uh, are we going to kick all the Romans out, basically? And they came back and said, however, however good an idea that might have been for historical purposes, it needed to have been done in like 1967. And the horse, the horse is out of the the, the stable now. So no, this would be a terrible idea. And and the board did not proceed with that plan. Okay. Those are both um, really big jobs. Like, so I have, a, I have a question of being someone whose persona is not Western European. Um, how do you feel about the heraldic uh, images being all based in Western Europe? So, Annoyed <laughs> and hopeful that there are changes coming. I think the thing that annoyed me most in the SDA for like 15 years was the part of the known world handbook that said that if you are not a Western European persona, you should expect to act like you are a guest in a foreign court. Ooh, <laughs> I, I missed and that. And I hated that. Yeah. <laughs> and I hated that because it meant I was never home, that I was always a visitor. And it meant that even though you could have, you know, a, a 16th century English king and a 9th century Norse queen, and that was okay, the fact that I'm from, my persona is from Japan, was a weirdness that had to be tolerated. And the SCA is moving past that. Our mission statement drops any reference to Western Europe. And heraldry is starting to look at ways of pulling in non-European sources and registrations. And so I'm, I'm grateful for their willingness to tackle that. And I am glad that there have always been heralds that are willing to work around the system to figure out ways of getting, for me, arms that work with the FCA's Western European system while still having a Japanese aesthetic. But I won't lie and say that it, there have not been a, a number of times when I've been real frustrated by it in, <laughs> in the last 16 years. That, that's for sure. All right, that, that was a little bit of a detour, but I, I was <laughs> curious. Um, so as for the awards, we all have one or two that might be super special to us. So what one did you feel was the biggest honor and why? So besides saying the, the two obvious ones, which are my cross and my lily, because they are genuinely uh, some of the biggest honors I've ever been paid in my life. The one that I always said was the award that if I got it, I could, I could die or pass from the SCA happily was the Order of the Dancing Monkey of the Barony of Kergalen. Because the Order of the Dancing Monkey is the Kergalen baronial version of the oath. It is given to people who bring joy uh, to events and to the barony. And I was the first person to get it who did not live and had never lived in Kergalen. And so it was a, an incredible honor for a group that I had spent a huge amount of time in, even though I'd never lived there, for them to say, you, you make it so much fun when you come visit us that we are going to induct you into this order that was so that is one of the highest regarded orders in that barony uh, because it goes to the heart of what the barony of Ter Galen wants to be in the SCA. I love it. I love it. That's great. That is really great. Um, I, I did notice that one on your list of awards. And I wondered, I wondered if that was going to be because some of the the awards that we give are very structured and some are super special and that's one of those special ones. So that's yeah. really cool. And when you are, when you are inducted, you, every other monkey that is in attendance comes up in court and dances like a monkey and <laughs> pretends to fling poo and uh, then you all dance like a monkey out of court. 
And I believe you can still find on YouTube a video of me getting the award and dancing like a monkey. I'm going to have to look for that. I am. All right. So uh, let's start with your Bardic background. Um, when did you become interested in Bardic? So that goes back to Lily's, actually. I had seen Bardic at Estrella, but I didn't spend a lot of time there because I was so overwhelmed by everything that was going on. At um, Lily's, I, I, so I was inspired by Estrella because I, uh, I like public speaking. And so I won my baronial Bardic competition uh, in June of 2005. And I thought that meant I was pretty good. And then I came to Lily's literally a week later. And I went to the Bardic encampment. And I was forced to tell myself that I didn't know garbage. Because the bards that I saw there were so phenomenally good that I had to up my game. And that's when I started getting serious about being a bard, was after having watched Michael the Ram and Dorcas mm -hmm. just knocked my socks off. They, they, they would, they would. Uh, so what was the first bardic thing you wrote? So the first bardic thing I wrote was an adaptation of a Japanese uh, children's folktale about a farmer who wants to be more than a farmer and so uh, prays and is granted the wish to become increasingly important people and then increasingly important spiritual forces and eventually even the sun, but finds at every step that everyone, no matter how high they are, has someone they answer to and some duty they must perform. And that by the time you're the sun, it is so important and you get nothing, you know, no days off that he wishes to go back to being a farmer and doing his duty and, and living that life. And it's a very Japanese folk tale about accepting your station and performing your duty. And um, that's the story that I adapted uh, to win the Baronial Bardic Championship. What was your inspiration to write it? Honestly, just I wanted to do something Japanese. It was um, at the time I started in the Northern Outlands, there were three of us doing Japanese. Um, and so I wanted to do something that reflected my commitment and my interest in Japan. And so I thought that if I went and researched folk tales and adapted it for length and content and to be a little more approachable to a Western audience, I could do something really interesting and something that is not, uh, was not as commonly seen at the time. Do you still have it? Do you, is it a, do you remember it? I remember most of it. Um, I would, I would want to go look it up again. I have it written down, but I would want to go refresh my memory before performing it again. Okay. Okay. Um, so when you first started with Bardic, not just that first one, but your beginning work there, how much research went into what you were writing? So it, I think I differentiated early on because I don't write songs. I do storytelling um, and so and poetry. And so the a lot of research went into the stories, but early on the poetry was was the bardic that I could do in in without a lot of research because uh, Japanese poetry I knew fairly well from my research. European poetry, I was an English major, so it's not like I was not exposed to traditional you know, European poetic forms. So I did poetry for something that I could do without a lot of research because I, I had already been exposed to it. And storytelling, I tried to go back and pin down as much as I could for what my skill levels were at, at, at each step of the way. So was the first piece you did a period piece or what was your first period piece that you did? 
I'm trying to think now what I would consider to be my first period piece. The folk, the, the folk story is plausibly period in that it was written down out of period, but there's, there's the, those kinds of stories were told in period and those kinds of stories do survive in extant pieces. It's just a matter of was that one, but did that one specifically survive? Mm -hmm. um, if that one, if not that one, then shortly after that, I started collecting period stories of uh, Japanese folk stories. And there are some that we can definitely trace to period. And I have a, a story that I've been telling since very early on about uh, the West African spider god Anansi that is almost certainly period, at least in most aspects. So when you start to write a period piece, tell me about how you begin to research it. Like where do you start? What information do you need to begin? I almost always start with Googling uh, uh, folk stories. I think there's a lot Folklore is part of the storytelling tradition that has survived as long as it has because the stories are meaningful and impart a lesson and can be orally transmitted by non-professionals. And so starting with folklore from a culture is almost always a good way to start getting grounded in enough, uh, grounded in the culture enough to then even if they're not period, start looking for other ones that are, or maybe older forms of those stories that we can document to period. Um, and then it's, it's a matter of narrowing down that fine line between being as period as humanly possible, while also as an entertainer still connecting with a very modern audience. And that's things like, content and that's also things like length like once upon a time people went to listen to uh, uh people reciting you know the the iliad and the odyssey for six hours at a time but that's not going to work at an fda bardic <laughs> no no so no, no. <laughs> finding finding first finding the stories that you want to tell then figuring out what kind of story you're specifically trying to to adapt and then figuring out how to trim it down and make it work, like I said, as period as possible while also not boring people out of their minds is kind of a, a big part of the process. Um, for poetry, it, it's more, that starts with immersing myself in the poetry as much as I can just to, to let it kind of sink, sink into my bones like reading sonnet after sonnet after sonnet to not just know that okay a sonnet is three quatrains and a couplet and it has a specific form but to really kind of let the word choices and let the structures that aren't the formal rules but are the informal rules that they were all using based on their culture and their viewpoints kind of sink into me um because that's, anyone can write a haiku, because a haiku is a very easy poem to, to bang out, because it's 575. Five. Um, and even the more period form, the tonka, is only 57577. Five, seven, seven. But there's a big difference between a tonka that's written by a very 21st century person and a tonka that's written in period. And it, it is only by really reading and, and letting the poetry suffuse you that you can go, oh, I see. This this is the kind of choice that I would that I would make here if I was not Matt Parker, if I was Saito Takaruzi. So you're finding the rhythm. You're fight you're 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 uh, I translating in that into my dancer brain would be listening to the music enough to find the right beats that you're listening for to be able to create create the art that you're trying to create. Yeah, exactly. I like it. 
Um, so tell me something in your research that you've done in the past, something that's like weird, fun thing you've discovered during the writing process. One thing that I, I discovered about haiku and tanka that I did not know um, before I discovered it, obviously, because then I wouldn't have discovered it, was <laughs> just how much the Japanese language cheats at haiku and tanka in a way that we can't in English. Um, and it's, there's a whole probably anthropology dissertation that could be done about how the structure of a language influences the kind of poetry that culture creates. And in Japan, there is a treasure trove of five syllable phrases that convey not just specific time and place, but emotional and cultural information that they can just put into a haiku or a tanka and, and works like a, a, a cultural unconsciousness or works like a, a trope that everybody knows. And one of them, uh, if I'm remembering it correctly, is Mizu Mirumi, which is five syllables and means water turning warm. But it doesn't just mean water turning warm, it also means spring. And things coming out of the thaw and nature beginning to bloom and life returning. It's like, I can't do that in English in five syllables, that's cheating. <laughs> and it, it's similar to in Italian, uh, uh, Dante wrote in a poetic style called Terze Rima, which is A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C. So it's, it's interlinked, uh, uh, three line stanzas. And that works so well in Italian because Italian has a huge amount more rhyming words than English does, which is why it's so hard to translate the, uh, uh, to translate Dante into English because you are losing so much of that poetic style. Right. So when did you start writing scroll texts? So I started writing scroll texts uh, a little bit after I moved to Kalantir. They don't do scroll texts in the Outlands. Um, in the Outlands, the, the text of a scroll is standard. Uh, there's some options you can pick from, but they're all pre-approved options and they're all in the, the scribal handbook. And that's because in the Outlands, every scroll is handmade. There are no preprints. So in order to, to manage that workflow, it's both, it's, pre, it's not pre-made scrolls, but it is a standardized text. Because if it was both, the workflow would get crazy and people would wait five years for a scroll. So it was not something that I realized happened until I moved to Calum. Um, and once I realized, oh, these scroll texts change every rain. So they need people to write these scroll texts every rain. That sounds like fun. Why don't I see if I can volunteer that? And the first time I did was Oswald and Kay's second rain when Rodri was in charge of getting the scroll texts written. And so um, after you wrote the preprint scroll text, have you written GOAs or POAs? Yes, so at this point I have written, I'm trying to think, I have written every, a, 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 a scroll text for every AOA order. I've written, I think a scroll text for every GOA order. And I think the old, I might've written a scroll text for every POA order. That's easier because there's only four. Um, right. So do you remember the first GOA you wrote? I do, and I pulled it up uh, uh, for that. The first GOA that I ever wrote was a lily for Vittoria de Rossi in the form of a Petrarchan sonnet. Okay. And then who was it? Wait, tell me, what, what's a Petrarchan sonnet, if I'm even saying that correctly? So a Petrarchan sonnet is the Italian form of a sonnet. Petrarch kind of invented or, or popularized the form, and then it got taken into the English uh, form as, as made most common by Shakespeare. Uh, the biggest difference between them is that the, um, the rhyme scheme is a little different, 
And the Petrarchan sonnet really f in, uh, focuses on the volta, the moment in the sonnet where the sub it turns, and volta literally means turn, it turns from being kind of a general philosophical poem to, oh, this is about something really specific now. Oh, so that would have been really fun to turn into a GOA. I like that. It was. It absolutely was. <laughs> it was. All right, so what was the first POA you, uh, or peerage you wrote? The first peerage of any kind that I wrote was uh, Duke Damien's County because we were all at Crystal Ball in the mid realm. And we were sitting in the basement drinking uh, during a break. And Damien was kind of complaining that he needed somebody to write his county scroll, but he wanted it like half bragging poem and half legal text. And I looked at him and I said, so you need a bard who's also a lawyer? And he went, yeah, hey, Uji, you want to write my scroll text? And I did. All right. So what was your, which, which scroll text was the hardest to write? Hardest to write, I think, was probably a sheer laurel because that, either a sheer laurel or the texts for Juliana and William. A Shears Laurel because I wanted, he's being made a Laurel, you know, for, for his shoemaking, but also for his Mongol cultural, culture and persona. So I wanted to make it really powerfully Mongol. I wanted it to be like, it could have been a series of verses out of one of the Mongol epic poems. And so I really worked to make it not just drawing elements from, but, but very deeply grounded and, and true to the epic of, I'm pulling up a name, um, the epic of Gare, I believe was then, uh, the epic of King Gaither. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the first scroll text where I really had like a supporting research paper that I sent with it. Because I did a, a kind of a 17 citation, two or three page documentation along with it, because I wanted a sheer to be able to look at it as a laurel and go, this is worthy of the laureate. And I had done kind of similar with Dobb for his uh, laurel, or excuse me. Um, yeah, he got a laurel, I think. I can't yes. Now. Yes. Uh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> it's been a long time since then, and it's been a lot of coronavirus. Um, I wrote it like it was a chapter from the Old Testament, and I wanted to make it very true to being this, you know, until now unearthed or un unearthed biblical text, and true in a very real way to his Jewish persona. Um, the texts for William and Juliana were, were a different challenge because they wanted mirror text. I'm holding up my hands, but no one can see it. They wanted mirror text where they were not the same, but they were referencing each other and they were mirroring each other's subjects. And, and so that was, that was a more difficult challenge mm -hmm. to write that in a way that was not, not a period text as much, but was true to them and what they wanted, both getting their pelicans at the same time. That's wonderful. <laughs> it is. So, so just because I know, because I was lucky enough to be crowned at the time, I love to uh, share scroll text. And I think that you read that completely well, because what we, what, what the Laurels acknowledged him for was his research in Mo his Mongol persona. So you read, you read okay. that one very well. Yes. Um, so what would you, say, what advice would you give to someone who was wanted to start researching and text, scroll text writing and writing poetry and legal texts and things like that? I think that, especially in a kingdom like Palantir, I would absolutely say that the, the best way to start is to, is to do. Um, because Palantir 
always needs scroll text. Every, every rain will need scroll text. It's never a bad thing to be practicing and then go, oh, cool, I've written this. This would work for this crown. Let me offer it to their royal scribe. I would also say what most people start with, certainly what I started with and what I think most people start with are what we call writ. The writ style is kind of the classic legal text FCA scroll style. You know, uh, to all by whom these present letters come, know we, Donegal and Catalina, king and queen, you know, by their diverse great efforts, blah, 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 blah. And I can, I can run that off really quickly because I've written a lot of them. And anyone who writes scroll text has almost certainly written a lot of them. And that's not to say that they're a bad form because they're not by any means. They are incredibly period, can be incredibly rewarding, and they can easily scale up or scale down. You can do a writ that is essentially six sentences long and a signature block and it's perfect. Or you can do a writ that's like Damien's duchy was also a writ. And I wrote it based on the uh, grant of privileges to the University of Paris. And it's a long text. That's a big scroll. Alessandra kind of hates me sometimes. Um, <laughs> and it, but so it, it can work for both in a way that, that other scroll styles maybe only can work if it's short, like the one I did for uh, uh, Baroness Zoe. It's a, it's a Korean style that literally maxes out at about like 35 words. Um, <laughs> so a writ can be real short or real long. And there are so many examples um, that you can go find to base off of. There's a, a group called Project Avalon that collects period medieval legal documents. And you can just go see writs granting, uh, granting rights to corporations or to individuals signed by Queen Elizabeth and go look at what they were actually using in a very real and very easy to access way. What is the name of that uh, website? It's Project Avalon and I can drop Avalon. a link in, I believe, uh, well. Well, we're probably gonna lose the chat once we're done here. But- oh, all right. Yes, it is, it is the, sorry, the Avalon Project out of Yale Law School. Okay, I might uh, get you to find that for me later and I'll post it as a comment on the uh, oh, video because I am getting this recorded. Unfortunately, I was neighbor, never able to get this onto Facebook Live today. For some reason, that's not working for oh, me. So, um, but I, I am recording it and I'll post it through YouTube later. So what would you tell young, young freshly in the SCA Uji about his SCA career? Um, I think I would tell him, you've got the right idea and just go with it. Because what, when I was in high school, I didn't have a lot of friends. I had the same two friends at the beginning of high school that I really had at the end of high school, who are now still two of my friends. Uh, uh, and I am still in touch with today. And but I was, I was kind of closed off. And I was also, frankly, kind of a jackass. Um, I, being the, the, being the fat kid, I responded to being teased by going, well, fine, I'm smarter than you are. And that's not a great way to make friends, it turns out. <laughs> so when I got to college, and especially when I found the FDA, I, I said, I want this to be the one thing in my life where I do it as hard as I can and I don't regret not doing something. And I would tell young Uji, there are gonna be times that this is very hard. There are gonna be times when this is very frustrating. There are gonna be times when you see things that are going to discourage you but you are going to have so many amazing experiences and you're going to meet so many amazing people that it is going to be so worth it and just 
take that idea and run with it as hard and as fast as you possibly can because choosing to do so will almost always be the right answer. All right. So I have one more question, but first I want to pause and see if anybody has any questions for you at this time. You can unmute yourselves. All right. I do. Oh, I, I have one question. And this is Marie. Hi, Uji. What, took, what took you to Thailand? I may have missed that, um, but I didn't think I heard the answer to that question. No, it was um, basically just wanderlust. I had always said that I wanted to travel the world. And my one of my role models when I was in high school was my French teacher who had learned French largely by getting on a plane to Europe and working his way through Europe and had crazy stories about, you know, crappy apartments and French uh, uh, wealthy uh, uh, society and getting to see everything in between. And I graduated college and I was working at Sears and my friend Nathan Brizendine, who is definitely not watching this, um, <laughs> said, hey, you should move to Thailand. I lived in Thailand for a semester when I was in school and you said you wanted to uh, see the world and you meet the qualifications to teach English in Thailand, which is that you have a bachelor's degree and you are white you should move to Thailand and, and see if you like it. And I said, all right, sounds like a plan to me. And I bought a one-way plane ticket and six weeks later, I moved to Thailand. Oh my gosh. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. That's amazing. That really is. I think Grimwolf has a question as well. Hello, I'm Grimwolf. Uh, I wanted to say thank you for doing all the work that you do, Uji. Uh, both modernly and in the SCA, because as pretty much you are incredibly consistent about helping others and looking out for other people. And I think that today you have brought much honor upon your cow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Master Grimmel. That's referencing that my personal website uh, that I put scroll text and SCA stuff on is www.dishonoronyourcow.com. <laughs> because I found that that was a website you could register on GoDaddy, and I thought it was too good not to have. I love it. <laughs> Uji is very well known here in Batavia. In fact, we have a little um, tradition with him at our Valor event called the 100 things that Uji is not allowed to do at Valor. Would you like to comment on that, Uji? So it is technically the 1,500 things Uji is not allowed to do at Valor, even though there's only about 300 things on the list. Um, <laughs> it, I like, I, I think it was 2013, I came to Valor, I had no responsibilities, I had nothing else to do. And so me and Lord Corey, who is her ladyship Caitlin's husband, sat around coming up with a list of things I was not allowed to do at Valor anymore. Um, which is based on the, a similar list from uh, 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 1500 things Mr. Welch is no longer allowed to do in an RPG. And so we spent just most of Valor coming up with this list and we put it in the morning announcements. And uh, so it was heralded and- All 1500 things? Up, no, we would put two or three in each morning. Okay. Um, it, it, it was things like, I'm not allowed to convince newcomers that if they die on the field, that they have to come back as a persona that believes in reincarnation. Um, I am not allowed to convince anyone that because it is the king of beers, the keg gets to sit up front in court. I am not allowed to put any made up royalty into the Kalantir lineage. Um, I am not allowed to mount the curb for any reason. And uh, most of them are not based on anything that actually happened, but we, we did have a couple that were, that evolved over that weekend because someone came up to me, a newcomer and was talking to people. And my friend introduced me as this is Uji. And the person looked at me and said, oh my God, I thought they made you up. 
<laughs> and so we dutifully wrote down, Uji is not allowed to convince anyone that he is made up. <laughs> I love it. I do. That's great. All right. So we all have those moments when we're tired and we need a break and we might be getting just done and just a little burnt out, but something brings us back. Some, there's some magic, there's some moment in the SCA, there's something about it that makes us remember why we're here and why we believe in this and why we do the things that we do. Tell us about your magical moment. I think, so th there's two that I'll talk about. One, one, one that was a one time and one that's recurring. The one time was one year at Quest for Camelot, which I tried to go to every year when I was an Outlander. I was the entirety of the Outland's rapier army. Uh, and there were 15 people on the North Shield rapier army. And we tied because we did, they decided it wouldn't be fair to just surround me and beat the tar out of me and call it a day. So we did essentially a day long tournament where I fought every single one of them best two out of three. And I had some of the most amazing moments in on the field that I have ever had in my life. And I fought everyone from a 15 year old who had authorized like a couple months before and in North Shield had to ask my permission to fight me because she was a minor to people that became their the very early uh, master uh, masters of defense because they were preeminent white scars. And at the end of the day, I fought a, a man who I'd fought before at Quest for Camelot and we went best two out of three. It took us like six times because of double kills and, and giving each other points of honor. And at the end of it, I was so exhausted, I could have died. But I had to go stand court as a Queen's Guard for uh, Bela and Claudia. So I was standing up there dying and they announced the results. And that King and Queen of North Shield had an agreement where only one of them spoke each court and they traded off. And it was the queen's turn that court. So she'd been speaking all court. And when they announced that the rapier army of North Shield had tied the lone man rapier army of the Outland, the king spoke for the first time and said, you tied? And he said, yes, your majesty. And then the king said, the Outland gets the war point. And that is one of my most amazing memories that I've, I've been a part of. The recurrent one that recharges me every year and that I'm so mad at the world that we didn't have this year is there aren't fireflies in Colorado. I had never seen a firefly until I was 19 years old at Lily. The stretch of road leading from the main campsite to the parking lot at night with all the trees dark overhead and the stars beyond them. Hey, man. Hey, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and I'm... fireflies. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. So the, that's all right. That stretch of road in the night with the, with the trees overhead and no cars coming and fireflies everywhere in a moment that could be a forest in Europe in the Middle Ages. I, I love that. And I love, even if I'm camping, I will go make that walk every year just to walk through the dark, cool night with the fireflies. And that's a magic moment for me when I, I can be lost in, in what we dream we are. I love it. I've, I've also walked through the woods at Lily's to see the fireflies coming from Los Angeles. There are no fireflies there. So I get what you're saying. <laughs> I do. It's like they have their own little world there. They do. It's, it's magic. It's, 
is. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you to everybody who came to join us. I, it's so wonderful to see your faces. I, I miss you guys immensely, all of you. Um, I'll be back again in two weeks. Um, next time we're gonna have Master Vincent Tavere join us. Uh, he's gonna talk about his work on uh, retention and retainment in the SEA. I initially asked him to talk about his work at the HARP. He goes, but can we talk about why I do the HARP? And, and I thought that was brilliant. I really did. So thank you, your Lordship, for joining us. Thank you, everybody else. And I will post this to YouTube since I didn't get to post it to Facebook today. And I'll try and figure out what went wrong there. And I'll share the link later on. Um, and I'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Your Grace. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you for what you do, Catalina. Thanks. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for Vittoria de Rossi for being here because I mentioned your, your lily scroll. I saw her. <laughs> Seamus really wants to say hi. <laughs> All right, bye everyone. <laughs>